Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. Well, the focus of my research is on what happens in places called cities of color. That's what I refer to them. Other people refer to them as minority majority cities. But as a historian, I'm digging down deeper into the nature of those relationships than let's say a sociologist would. Because as a historian, I want to understand the historical context for why African Americans and Latinos are getting along some of the times and oftentimes not getting along. So it is really trying to understand both the historical and contemporary dimensions of black-brown relations. Well, it was a natural topic that, uh, that I, I was drawn to because it really reflects a, a career-long kind of, of research and interest for me. Uh, I study ethnic and racial minorities in American cities historically, right? Uh, but this place in particular, this place called Compton in South Central Los Angeles, I was born and raised there. So in a, in a sense, I'm going back to the origins to study a problem that is unique in one way to Compton, but really uh, representative of the nation as a whole because many of the places like Compton, located not only throughout California, but throughout the nation, in fact, they constitute the majority of communities and cities in the United States that are becoming minority majority cities. So it was clear uh, that this was a connection for me in my research from early on to come back to this topic, but explore it in a different way. Uh, for me, perhaps the most important thing was getting a sense of the profile of the community, historical profile. And since none existed, I had to create that. Um, and that meant built, doing the building blocks of historical research. Um, archival research, newspaper research, uh, census data. So the, creating this, this profile of the community. And then, because this topic is virtually unresearched for the most part by historians, I've had to engage in a pretty massive oral history recovery project with African-American people who came there in the 40s and 50s and 60s and Latino folks that have been there for generations as well as recent immigrants, older people, younger people. So that kind of research uh, requires a lot of people. So I've involved undergraduate and graduate students involved in the oral history recovery process. Well, oral history is um, it's a complicated uh, and time-intensive research process. You have to identify the people, and there are a variety of ways to identify people. Oftentimes, historians, unlike social scientists, uh, who will try to do a random sample, historians don't go after random samples. We identify people, make contacts, make additional contacts, interview people, identify additional interviewees. So it's more kind of a, of a cascading effect of identifying who are the people that we want to talk with. But normally identifying categories of people, so for example, African American pioneers, that is who came in the 40s and 50s, the first people to come into a community that had been segregated for 80 years. Um, or Mexican American immigrants uh, like my own parents who came in during the early 20th century. And, or other categories of people, recent Latino immigrants who have come from Mexico or Central America in the last 15 or 20 years. So you identify categories of people and then you identify the kinds of questions you want to get at. So for me, I use what a lot of historians use as the life history approach. So I may want to get at the topic of how Latino immigrants are bringing with them attitudes and perceptions about African Americans who will end up being their neighbors. Uh, but at the same time, I want to know uh, what is, what's the historical context for understanding what attitudes those immigrants will bring to a place like Compton or East Palo Alto or other places like it. So you have to uh, consider lots of viewpoints. Uh, you have to approach the life history in a way that you let them talk about the, their background, the familial background, when they came to a place like Compton, kinds of jobs they had, the development of the family, the raising of the family, and then you get to the part that gives you the context for what I'm studying. Why is it that Latino immigrants are having difficulty be, uh, interacting with African Americans? Same kinds of questions I get at, but in a kind of different context for African Americans. So the back end of the process for oral histories, so you collect these oral testimonies and they're rich, but you can't do anything with them until you're, you're, you're analyzing them. 
So a research assistant, I will ask the research assistant to do verbatim transcription. So we have the full transcript, right? That becomes a historical document uh, because we can't go to the archive to get that information because for the most part it doesn't exist. So we are creating the archival material. Then we get uh, the, the graduate students or the undergraduates to start determining what are the various characteristics of 10 or 15. In this case, I have about 125 interviews. What are the characteristics that seem to be trends among the different groups of people that I'm interviewing? So then as a historian, I pull that out and say, how can I make sense of this? You know, 15 of the 20 people we interviewed said this about something. And so we begin to see the, hit the patterns which give us indication of this is, a, this is a common occurrence or this is a common attitude that people are holding or this is a common context uh, of, what, of what they bring to Compton. On the topic of African-American and Latino relations uh, in a place like Los Angeles, they, their attitudes are pretty much determined by the media. And the media paints a horrid picture of, of these groups. Um, gang, intergroup gang warfare, murder, mayhem, you name it. It's blood, uh, and, and if it bleeds, it leads in the news, right? Whether it's the print media or the electronic media. So the most surprising thing that I think people will come away with with this research, if you get below the more dramatic aspects of it, that is political tension among the Latino and African American leaders, you go down to the neighborhood level, you begin to see elements of cooperation, especially among women that are tending to their children in the same neighborhoods where they're going. They may have difficulty communicating, but there's something basic about caring for your family, right? And it's not to suggest these unite people, but it begins to allow them to see that there are some commonalities instead of differences. But that we don't hear about that in the press. These are the things that are going on daily. Another thing, there's dozens and dozens of organizations in East Palo Alto and, and Los Angeles, other places that I'm now investigating, where this work of creating coalitions of, ha of, of very explicit steps for people to understand and live with one another, how that occurs, uh, these groups are facilitating that. We never hear about that in the press. So those are the surprises I think that most people will come away with uh, once this research is published. Well, inspirations for, for my research, it really comes from what people have done uh, in the past to create new avenues of understanding, uh, new research areas that are evolving. In my lifetime and in, in the area of American social history, for example, it's been transformed. Uh, the readings that I give my graduate students now, for example, are absolutely, every one of them is different from what I cut my academic teeth on, right, my intellectual teeth. So that new literature, the, this, whether it's history or some other humanity discipline or a social science discipline, generates new ideas, that generates new questions, and that for, as a historian, for me, uh, pose, I pose questions and then see if I can answer those questions with the kind of research that I do. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.